Alright, so I want to talk about John chapter 3, and in particular this word water in verse 5. Okay, so first of all, I want to read John chapter 3, uh, just a few verses here, so that we can get a clear understanding of what the Bible actually says. And then let's see what people are saying. Let's go to God first, and then we'll go to man and see what they're saying, okay? Starting verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Let me read those uh, few verses again here. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? <clears throat> now pay attention here. Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water, that is, from your mother's womb, and of the spirit which is from above he cannot enter into the kingdom of God that which is born of the flesh is flesh that's being born of your mother's womb and that's being born of water that's being born of the flesh all right and then that which is born of the spirit which is from above which is from God is spirit so we got, um, we got <laughs> very easy identifiable words here that we can connect the dots to to show us exactly what this water means, what it represents. So when a woman's water breaks, the baby, the child, is ready to be birthed. The baby is ready to be born, <clears throat> right? That's very simple. Very simple stuff. I think women probably understand this better than men. Uh, but when the water breaks, the child is ready to be delivered. And we are all born of the flesh. Therefore, we are all born of water. We, all, we are all born from our mother's womb. It's all the same thing. But we are not all born of the Spirit. And that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. And there's a difference, obviously, between being born of the flesh and being born of the Spirit. Now, back in 95, uh, you know, Six years before I was even um, a true believer, really, I set out to prove the Bible wrong. And by the time I got to John chapter 3, by the time I read this, I had come to the realization that the Bible's not wrong, but I'm wrong. This just makes too much sense. Alright? 
It just does. It makes so much sense. It's unbelievable. I got it. I tried to deny it, tried to resist it. In 2001, I could no longer deny what the Word of God says. I knew it was true. I knew it was true the whole time. And Hebrews 4, verse 12, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints in marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So as you're reading the Bible, the Bible is reading you. And it read me, and it was um, very apparent to me that, that I was wrong. I was flat out wrong about the Bible. So, I mean, that's a good thing because, you know, realizing, hey, you know, you're wrong about something. Uh, that means you have an opportunity to know what is right. Now, I want to focus on this word, water. Now, how can you screw this up? How can people screw this up? Is it really that complicated? You got mother's womb. You got being born of water. And you got that which is born of the flesh is flesh. There shouldn't be any doubt what being born of water means here in verse 5. Now, there's a, there's a law, I don't know what the law is, but Murphy's Law or something where if anything can go wrong, it will go wrong, and people will get this wrong if it's, if, you know, it's just inevitable. So here, let's take a look at somebody that's got it wrong. Now, by looking at what is wrong, sometimes it will help us to understand better what is right. JP says, I've noticed some pastors are saying the same thing about the water represents the first birth. But in John 4, verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Seems to me the water in John 3, 5 is the living water in John 4, 10. To me, that would be synonymous with the gospel, the everlasting gospel. Alright, so uh, that technically does not make any sense. Alright, so in John 4, uh, if you're familiar with it, I guess we, just to go over it, I guess, um, so the woman comes to uh, to the well with Jesus, and um, there come a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which of uh, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Now, there's two different waters being talked about here. There's one in the well, and then there's one of the living water, which is the Spirit of God. Now, how do you determine which of these two that you're going to compare with John 3, 5? You're just picking and choosing which one you want to use. There's no basis for it. You understand what I'm saying? There's no basis for it. Well, here's the word water. And in John 4, we also see the water, but we see the water represented two different ways. Now, what I'm going to say is forget about what's in John chapter 4 and just look at the context of what's here in John 3, verses 4 through 6. 
can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? Except, and that's the question being asked. And Jesus says, except a man be born of water, mother's womb, and of the spirit, that is of God, cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh, which is to say to be born of water, which is to be which is to say to be born of his mother's womb. It's all in the context and it's it's told to us exactly what this is referring to. There sh there shouldn't be any possible way to screw this up yet people do. So let's go read some more comments here. 100% on the money. That's brilliant. Well, you got somebody on your side. That's you might have everybody on your side, but doesn't mean you're right. And Abraham says, think about this. He that is born of water is water, and he that is born of spirit is spirit. It seems that it is talking about different birth here. He gets it. It's very simple. It doesn't, I, I mean, <clears throat> if I were to argue with Abraham... I would say it doesn't seem like it at all. It is talking about different births here. There's no question about it. How in the world you could read this and not understand it is beyond me. It really is. Remember, Nicodemus was so wrapped in a physical birth, therefore Christ has to make the distinction between the two births. Exactly. Because Jesus understood that being born of the mother's womb is to be born of the water. And he's making a distinction between the water and the spirit. And the water being flesh and the spirit being of God. The spirit of God. So, <laughs> and, and basically, I just want, because there's this conversation going on here, I just wanted to... Uh, basically confirm what Abraham said here give him support <clears throat> and then here comes Nicodemus or JP or whoever Nicodemus was thinking physical birth but the Lord Jesus Christ said flesh is flesh so he wasn't talking about physical birth or rebirth alright so that right there again is somebody that is utterly confused but the Lord Jesus Christ said flesh is flesh so he wasn't talking about physical birth now think about that to be born of the flesh is a physical birth uh, does not I, unless I'm just haven't had enough coffee. That doesn't make any sense at all. The water that he was talking about in John 3, 5 it is water and spirit simultaneously. So if we go here, except the man be born of water and of the spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He's making a distinction between the two. Except the man be born of water and of the spirit. He's making a distinction. Flesh and the spirit. Um, I don't know how somebody can get this wrong. It's beyond me. The water is living water. Which is the words that are spirit and life. That's not what the what in verse 5. That's not. The, the living water that we read about in verse in, in John chapter 4 and John 6 the words is the everlasting gospel revelation 4 you're just jumping all over the Bible here right in Revelation 22 whosoever will let him take the water of life freely that's not the spiritual birth. That Well, that is, I'm sorry. That is the spiritual birth, but that's not 
the being born of water in John chapter 3 verse 5 that's I mean you're just taking a verse and not you're just pulling it out of thin air and applying that to John chapter 3 verse 5 based on nothing and you, that's not how you study the Bible that's not how you connect the dots what you do is you actually read the Bible and you see very closely that the Nicodemus is talking about the mother's womb and then you connect the dot with being born of water and then again that which is born of the flesh is flesh. So that's how you study the Bible. You don't just pull out verses out of thin air that have no direct connection to that particular issue. I mean, you could just as easily pull out uh, verses where they're drinking water, you know, like at the Rock of Oreb where they're drinking water, and and then somehow applying that to John chapter three and saying this is this is the water from the wa the from the Rock of Horeb. Well, based on what? I mean, you could make that same logical or illogical argument. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. Now, you could say, well, except a man be born of water. Well, it's talking about the water that come from Horeb, and you can drink this water. Go drink that water. That's the water you drink. Except a man be born of water. That's based on nothing. And so also when you're going to John 4, John 6, Revelation 22, what have you, whatever, you're basing it. There's no direct connection. If you just actually read what John 3 says, there should be no doubting about it. Right? And to me, it just blows my mind. How can somebody get something that is so simple, so wrong? It's unbelievable. Okay, so anyway, that's enough. I just wanted to go over that. And if you guys have any doubts, man, if I'm not making this very simple to understand, I mean, all you have to do is read. It should be very clear. Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born except a man be born of water what's he talking about be born being born of his mother's womb except a man be born of water and of the spirit that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit it, this is simple English, man, and I don't even hardly know English, but I know it enough to know that the water here is directly connected to the mother's womb and directly connected to the flesh. It's not complicated, but well, they talk about people that get things wrong. Okay, so never, I don't want to get into that. All right, so I want to go. Uh, let's see. These go through these comments here. What do I say to someone who asks, "Who did Jesus pray to in the garden?" If he's God Himself, so that's a great question. All right, and Karen says that uh, female to male and male to female, and I get scared when I see those kinds of things, and I don't know. Okay, so. What do you say to someone who asks, what did Jesus pray, or, excuse me, who did pre, <laughs> I need more coffee. Who did Jesus pray to in the garden if he's God himself? So that's a good question. Now, what is that? John, or not, well, let's see. Like in Matthew 
29. It might have been way off. 26, 27. Yeah, let's go. Let's go with this one right here. Matthew twenty-six, verse thirty-nine. And let's just let's start here. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further, and fell on his face and prayed, saying. O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. All right, then he comes to the disciples and finds them sleeping, and he says, Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Come on, man. Or something like that. So, in this situation here, Jesus is um, in the flesh. He is God Almighty in the flesh. Okay, God is manifest in the flesh. He is the Son of God. He is the Son of Man. He is the Christ, the Savior, the Mighty God. Now, when he is praying and saying these things, he's saying it in the flesh. So, you think about it. The way I think about it is Jesus is our role model. He is our example. He is our leader. So when Jesus goes to the grave and then raises back up to life and ascends to heaven, we're going to follow him. So he has led the way all the way through his life so that we can have that role model that we can follow in our life okay so now apply this to your life uh, Jesus is very sorrowful he's in a very in a state of uh, extreme sorrow because he knows what's about to happen and it's heavy on his heart and he fell on his face and prayed. So when you are in that state, and don't tell me you've never been in that state. I've been there and that's part of life. It's hard. But when you're in that state of sorrow, think about what Jesus did. He fell on his face and he said, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. So he's saying, not of my will, but as the will of God. Let it be his will and not your will. And he comes under, okay, well, excuse me. So does that make sense? So he's leading the way. He's showing us the way. And, th and then you could take this and apply this to every other time that he is praying oh my father if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it thy will thy will be done so again he's he's put he has put himself into our shoes if you will he's in our flesh and by being in our flesh he is giving us uh, he, he is setting the example. He is the role model for us. So when we're sorrowful, don't think about your will, but think about God's will and what God wants, not what you want. Obviously, um, you want a life of no sorrow and no pain, uh, a paradise. We all want that. And God has promised that for us, but it's not in this world. This world has to come to an end. And because Jesus endured very hard things, so also should we expect to endure, have to endure very hard things. And we already have, and I'm sure you can testify to that, and I, I certainly can myself, okay? So I hope that makes sense. Why, why did Jesus pray to the Father? Because 
He is setting the example for us. He is leading the way for us. Now, look. If it wasn't a great mystery, then it would. Then the Bible wouldn't say it's a great mystery. But it is a great mystery. You have to get over this fact that you don't know everything about everything. Just because you don't fully understand it doesn't mean the Bible's wrong, right? It doesn't mean Jesus is not God. Okay, you in order to say Jesus is not the Father, you have to say the Bible's wrong. The Bible's not wrong. Right? And without controversy, without any doubting about it, great is the mystery of godliness. Right? It's a great mystery, no question about it. But I, to me, that that's how I look at it, you know? I mean, it's, it's very simple. I try to look at things very simple, and to me, when I see this, it's Jesus setting the example, being the role model. So when we're in this similar situation, that we can look upon or remember Jesus and how he was when his soul was exceedingly sorrowful and he had a heavy heart and he knew what was about to come because that very well could happen to us in our life I mean if if everything goes well you know barring some catastrophic event there's gonna be a point in our life where we're gonna realize we ain't got much longer to live and soon we're going to die and you're going to have those same thoughts and hopefully you'll remember that as Jesus said not as I will but as thou will so also will you say not as my will but as God's will let it be done. Okay, does that make sense? I, I hope that's how I understand it. If you think I'm wrong, if there's something I'm leaving out or what have you, if I'm anything at all, just let me know. If I'm a bozo the clown, let me know. I want to hear from you. I appreciate these comments. It helps me to understand and learn the Bible just as much as it might for you. All right, thanks again.